Congratulations for taking ownership of your financial plan by tuning into the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast, hosted by Mason and Associates, financial advisors with over three decades of experience serving you. You will rest easy once your plan is done. You will see clearly just how you have won. Gone are the times where you'd hope and pray. It's gonna be a bright, 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 bright sunshiny day. Welcome to the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. I'm John Mason, Certified Financial Planner and President at Mason & Associates. This is going to be an awesome episode. We are happy to introduce Steinbacher, Goodall, and Yurchak. It's an estate planning firm, a um, law firm in Pennsylvania that's going to help us discuss a variety of issues like what happens when you do estate planning documents in Virginia and you move to Pennsylvania. Um, We are capable of talking about some of the issues with clients who have a second home in Florida or maybe moving to Florida. And then we're also going to focus on things like estate administration, where admittedly, Tommy and I are a little weak. We know what it takes to draft the documents. We know what it takes to implement those documents. Where we don't have a lot of visibility is where we get to the back end of this, where our clients or maybe even you listening to this podcast end up actually having to serve and do what those documents say. So we're really excited today. Tommy Blackburn, CFP, CPA, PFS, and then we have Megan Ingram and Julie Steinbacher um, here with us today as our guest. Everyone, welcome to the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. Thank you so much for having us today. We're excited to be here. Um, and, and I'll do a little bit more of an introduction here. Um, so Julie, you are the founder of the firm. You're an owner of the firm. You serve in a variety of capacities. And we were talking before we launched the, the recording here. Maybe both of you can just share a little bit about what your typical day looks like, who the clients are that you're typically serving. That way our audience can kind of get to know you a little bit before we dive into some of these other topics. I'll go ahead and go first. So thanks again. My name is Megan Ingram. I have been an attorney with Steinbacher Goodall and Yurchek since 2020. I primarily focus my practice in special needs planning. So I am working with families um, during life to get a plan in place um, if they have a child or a loved one who has a special need or a disability and find out how we can get the supports and the plan in place to provide their loved one with the care that they need um after their parents or their loved one passes away and figure out how we can pass that individual and inheritance in a way that's not going to jeopardize their health insurance or any other kinds of government benefits that they might be receiving i also do quite a bit of wealth protection planning um, in our firm as well um, to do planning for families who have estates of one and a half million or more maybe they have a business there are some special tax considerations that we need to keep in mind And I also do some long-term care planning um, with individuals. I'm Julie Steinbacher. I am the founder of Steinbacher Goodall and Yerchak. I actually started uh, the firm over 20 years ago in my garage of my house. And we have now grown to um, seven locations serving uh, Northeast uh, Central Pennsylvania. And, you know, from a day-to-day standpoint, um, I could be doing um, all kinds of different things. But what I really love doing is helping clients really think about what happens if they get sick. What do they need to do today to make sure that they're protected? What happens if they pass away? Who's going to get what stuff? How can we make sure that uh, what they have gets to their beneficiaries in the simplest, most tax advantage manner possible? And you know, lastly, we have a real focus at our firm on what happens if you don't just get sick, but you get dementia. What do we need to do today um, as a family to prepare for that journey? And so I, I consider myself extremely privileged that I get to spend my days talking to people um, and making a plan for the future so that they can age in place, so that they can get their assets to their loved ones simply and easily and not pay any more tax than what they need to. 
And I deal with both the planning end of it, and I also deal with the administration end. So on any given day, I could be dealing with families who their loved one has passed away or people who are preparing for that. Well, thank you for the intro, both of you. And Julie, congratulations on, on the firm. I think, you know, Mike and Ken are founders at Mason and Associates. I don't know that they started in their garage or do you say garage or basement? <laughs> No, I said my yeah. garage. Yeah, it started in my so, garage. <laughs> um, but we've heard other awesome people who have started things from the garage. I'm pretty sure Apple was started in a garage, if I got that right. So congratulations on everything you built. And we personally have referred your firm um, in the past, and, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be able to continue to do that. And one of the ways that, that we found your firm was through ActTech, I believe. I, I think one or more of you are on ActTech and then after ActTech, it was like, let me go to their websites. Let me see who is legit, who's not legit. And kind of the thing that pushed me over the edge in recommending your firm was the fact that you also have a podcast and that y'all are, I don't know if you're actively producing content or you're repurposing, but I was impressed at the level of activity. And so maybe share a little bit about your podcast um, what ActTech is, because our audience is going to be nationwide, even not in the United yeah. States listening to this podcast. So what is ActTech? How can people find good quality estate planning firms? Obviously, if people are in PA, maybe they want to look you up and, and see the services that you can provide. But maybe one of y'all can touch on those things. Yeah, great. Yeah, so I'm a member of ActTech, um, and so is Amos Goodall. And ACTEC is the American College of Trust and Estates Council. And it's a phenomenal group of really leading uh, attorneys across the nation. It's difficult to become a member of ACTEC. And it really shows that somebody is really a good substantive attorney, in my opinion. And it's a commitment. Um, I commit to attending and being an active participant. Being a member of ACTEC is not something you hang up on your wall. Uh, you're supposed to um, attend the events and, and actively work on the committees. And it's just been a phenomenal uh, journey for me. Uh, and it is something that's unusual, particularly in the localities that we're at, which um, although we service uh, clients in the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh area, our office is more in the rural parts of Pennsylvania. And it's very unusual to have attorneys who are members of ACTEC in the more rural areas. Um, and that's part of the process that you have to go through to become a member and to be nominated and to have all of the experience that you need to have uh, to be part of that. Um, on the other side of it, um, also, I also have an LLM in elder law, um, and so does Amos Goodall. Uh, and that's unusual. So an LLM is a master's degree after you become an attorney, as if you haven't went to school long enough. Uh, we also um, have CELAs, Certified Elder Law Attorneys, at our office. And so um, I believe very strongly that, you know, the law keeps changing, the world is changing, and that we as attorneys have to keep up on those changings, changes so that we can serve our clients better. And podcasts are one of them. Uh, so, you know, when COVID hit, we had always at our firm had a resource center where for years, um, the idea was that I took some of my marketing dollars and put it into our resource center, which was a, a building where we had seminars. And the idea was to educate people, to let them know what was going to happen in the second half of life. What did they need to know? And really, you know, to serve the public, whether they were our clients or not. And when COVID hit, obviously that that shut down. And at that time, we made a commitment to taking that type of programming um, through a podcast. And so it's the Second Half of Life podcast. And John, you're correct. Sometimes we're really good at getting good content on there. And sometimes we're repurposing um, things that we think are beneficial that we've done for other purposes, such as seminars, um, but still able to make it so that people are able to gather that information um, so that they can educate themselves and make the best decision possible for their lives. Well, it's amazing how similar our firms are. And for our audience, you've probably heard us talk about this in the past, but we, our marketing strategy was seminars and we would have two seminars a month. We would order 
Domino's pizza or whatever it was. We'd have some Cokes and pizza and we used to market, Julie, um, this is not a gourmet meal, but it's a gourmet meal for your mind. And, and the, oh, nice. the difference was you can go to those free steak dinner seminars, you know, or you can come to a place where we're going to give you pizza and it's more of like this down home real thing rather than this like fake, you know, Schlesinger steak or, or right. what have you. So then um, we noticed our participation in seminars really started dwindling in 2017, 18, whenever we stopped doing them. And whether it's the, the marketing, the fiduciary rules, whatever it was, there was a switch where mm -hmm. we started getting a lack of participation, but the radio show always did great for us. And then when we launched the podcast, it's been a way to connect with folks across the country like y'all. So very similar paths. Um, let's, let's call out episode 23, Tommy, before we dive into more of the meat and potatoes with Megan and Julie. Episode 23 was with Heather Shada, Virginia Estate and Trust Law. They're in Richmond, Virginia, and we have a lot of clients in Virginia. We've used Virginia Estate and Trust Law quite extensively. Um, in addition to listening to this podcast, we would love audience. Make sure you go back, listen to episode 23. These two are really going to complement each other uh, because there's going to be similarities. There's also going to be specific differences as we talk about admin. Pennsylvania and Florida, which we did not cover in that that previous episode. So let's talk a little bit about philosophy, Megan, on estate planning documents. And let's say Tommy's working with a client in Virginia. He helps them get a beautiful estate planning package, which maybe I will oversimplify. Hopefully you don't uh, disagree. A revocable living trust two wills, two powers of attorney, two medical directives. They may have different names in different states, but essentially directions what happens when I die, some sort of probate avoidance strategy called revocable trust, who can make financial decisions for me if I can't, and who makes medical decisions for me if I can't. So we have this beautiful binder. We have all this stuff. We worked really, really hard getting it right. And then they moved to Pennsylvania. What happens now? Well, I would say the next best thing they can do is sit down with an attorney in Pennsylvania to review that and make sure everything is still good to go under Pennsylvania law. Estate planning law tends to be very state specific. There are some things that transfer very well between state lines and other things that Pennsylvania is very picky on. Um, the very first thing I would say is those powers of attorney. Pennsylvania is very, very picky on what it needs to see specifically in that power of attorney for who can manage my money and my finances. On a personal note, I, I have yet to see um, a, a power of attorney for finances and assets done in another state that meets all of the requirements of everything Pennsylvania needs a power of attorney to have um, just because Pennsylvania is very specific. Now I will say, and Julie, correct me if, if my understanding here is incorrect, but some of the things that Pennsylvania requires in a financial power of attorney, if someone's POA does not say that thing, um, Pennsylvania might say it's still valid, but the rules are going to be very, very different if someone challenges it. And also in a, in a practical standpoint, our experience is um, some of the banks or the financial institutions that the client might be presenting this financial power of attorney to, if it looks very different from the types of documents that they're used to seeing under Pennsylvania law, um, for very good reason, the bank and the financial institution in the interest of protecting their customer might be hesitant to accept it and to honor it. So for all of those reasons, I'm going to say someone who's moving into Pennsylvania, very likely that that financial power of attorney might need to be updated. The medical powers of attorney who can make my medical decisions for me, more likely that those documents might be okay under Pennsylvania law, but again, very state specific. And some of the things that we're going to have to really look through the terms of that document to see what it says, um, and make sure everything is covered in it. The client switches are clearly spelled out um, as Pennsylvania needs it to say. A revocable living trust tends to travel pretty well across state lines, especially if we're just using that revocable trust for probate avoidance. If any kind of a trust is kind of looped into any kind of long-term care planning, then we're gonna to have to look through it with a fine tooth comb. 
but a revocable living trust for probate avoidance is usually usually um, in good shape when it comes to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is usually more lenient through that. But in my experience, some of the big things that we're updating in those documents, even though Pennsylvania law um, is pretty compliant and meshes well with the other state, is do we need to update any of the decision makers or any of the players in that document? I oftentimes will see um, folks choosing banks or financial institutions, some kind of professional decision maker for a trust as an executor for a will. And so we're always going to need to look through and make sure, first off, does that bank or that financial institution cover Pennsylvania? Um, do you even, do you have completely different banks and financial institutions now? Did you go with someone more local and maybe we could, we should shift decision makers then? Or maybe you've, uh, maybe you didn't choose a bank or financial institution, but the individuals you chose are no longer as close to you geographically. And maybe their goal was that they want someone more closer geographically. And so even if the contents of the document and the terms of the documents are okay under, under Pennsylvania law, we're always going to need to be looking through um, every part of the document to see, even though the law's okay, practically doing. Well, there's certainly a lot to unpack there. To um, a lot of a lot of good information for our clients, <laughs> and you know, the I think one thing you hit on early there, Megan, was that if they look different, uh, boy, we battle frequently with financial financial institutions. Very often, the big banks. Very often, um, these people who just say. That financial power of attorney is three years old. I'm not going to accept it. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. you don't really have a choice. Yeah. But then it's like, are we going to get in a lawsuit? Like, are we going to like, what are we going to do here? Like, how how deep are we going to fight this? So I can certainly see from experience. And, and we often, Tommy, ask clients to update their documents every five to seven years, just so it's fresh, it's clean, it's hard to dispute that this was my intent. It becomes much easier for for people to kind of stick their nose up at you if it's 25 years old and, and then they just want to wipe their hands of it. For sure. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's even the state of Virginia is like the law says you have to accept this document, but the banks still say don't care, not going to accept it. Um, so then it's, you know, what's the cost of trying to enforce it as usually not worth it. Um, almost, I think, yeah, John, that's all great stuff. So, I am curious, what do y'all advise on how often should documents be reviewed, um, regardless of whether we're traveling state lines? And to the power of attorney point, I think it's almost why it's one of the reasons John and I, I think we have a love-hate relationship with trust. And one of the reasons we like them or push them potentially is to get around this power of attorney mm -hmm. issue. It seems like trustees don't encounter anywhere near um, the pushback that a power of yeah, attorney we does. I totally agree with that. The power of attorney document is just becoming more and more difficult. Um, and the, the reality of it is people are coming to us to do an estate plan often because they want to make it easier for their children or whoever is going to be their decision maker and to put all that time and energy into having a plan and then not keeping it updated just doesn't make sense. So we we always tell our clients um, that they need to think about updating it. Now in our state, for many people, we have a mental health power of attorney and that needs to be reviewed every two years. So that kind of makes it a natural thing at our office that we would be reaching out to them. But also important if anything happens in their life, they get a diagnosis, um, they have a death of a, of a child, um, and, and for many years, I've told people, you know, every and I don't know if I'd still say this, but like every presidential election, uh, you know, every four years, I think is a really good amount of time. If you don't have anything else going on that you need to be looking at the documents and updating it. And, you know, a lot of times clients will say, well, I don't want to have to come back to you. Like I know, like my job, I'm trying to do a really good job and they hope they never have to see me again. And I always think about it, you know, like it's kind of like when you buy a car, you, you make a major investment, but it'd be kind of crazy not to get the oil changed or get new brakes on it. And so often when we're making changes, 
as many times we're making changes because their lives have changed. Um, or the law, like when the SECURE Act came out, there was just a small thing that needed to be done differently or could be done better or look at it. But the overall revocable living trust or the overall plan doesn't need to be redone, just little changes. And I think that that's important for people to know, even when we talk about having to redo powers of attorneys, it's a pain, but they're the simpler, less expensive part of all of this. Um, and so I really urge people, if you have an attorney and you have a plan, you should go back and see them and, and relook at it. Relook at it in today's light of what your life is like and what the law is. Make sure it's still the best plan for you. Well, I like the, I mean, I didn't know about the, the mental health power of attorney in Pennsylvania and the, the two-year requirement. So that's certainly an interesting thing that, that we don't have in Virginia, to my knowledge. And mm -hmm. there are differences between states. Like, I'm pretty sure... Well, I know we have a transfer on death deed for mortgages or properties in Virginia, transfer on death deed capabilities. I don't think you have that in Pennsylvania. Um, you have we do not. a healthcare power of attorney. We have a Virginia advanced medical directive. So there are differences between states and being able to make sure that you have documents that fit your state. So I'm curious, Julie, Megan, if your clients are having to come back every two years for this mental health power of attorney, is this something where you literally just go back in to the healthcare power of attorney and the financial and just hit file print and have them sign new ones every two years? Are you doing that? Are you charging for that? What does that look like from a practical standpoint? Yeah, so we keep a database in our office of everyone who signs that mental health power of attorney and we send reminder letters um, when that power of attorney is coming due and so then whenever um, that client would call in to sign their, their mental health power of attorney renewal, we ask at that time whether they have any updates to make. If they don't, if they wanna keep the same decision makers, it is a very, um, very easy process for us to update it. Um, we do charge a fee to cover our expenses for preparing that document, preparing that file. But we also ask whenever that client calls in if they want a review appointment, if they want a full file review to double check everything else in their life, if they've had a major life event or even not just to check in and make sure everything is good to go. Um, as Julie kind of mentioned, we are updating our documents all the time, even if the laws are not changing, but as we're learning, you know, Julie, you mentioned you go to those act tech conferences. I personally, I attend um, conferences regularly for the Academy of Special Needs Planners, for um, conferences related to special needs planning. We are regularly updating these documents just as we're learning new things and consulting with other attorneys in the field. So it's not uncommon for someone to come into our office um, for that mental health power of attorney renewal. And we're looking at, at their other documents and saying, these are still good. We've added a couple other things um, to these documents. Do you want to hear what those are and see if you want to update the, the, your documents? And there are so many nuances, Megan, with, with different states. And that's kind of where we're talking now on these different state plannings or you're moving. And we deal a lot with that with our clients who retire and relocate. Um, in Virginia, for example, I'm pretty sure I'm quoting this correctly. Tommy, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if I have an executor who lives in Virginia, that is easier than me having an executor that lives in Pennsylvania or Florida, who would then have to like physically come back to qualify potentially, maybe even have to purchase a bond, or if they're Virginia residents, it's a little bit easier. And is that true in PA is one question. Um, and then the second question is, you mentioned the language and updating your documents, and I don't know, Julie, maybe this is better for you, is, when you draft your documents, or do, do you all purchase software that provides templates or do you draft your own language in these documents where you, know, you get all of your best ideas and, and your attorneys do that? Yeah, so I'll take the, the drafting, the updating one uh, in this situation. Um, you know, we're really proud of the fact that we uh, do do our own documents. Um, and so I actually am one of the authors of the Pennsylvania Trust Guide and um, we're not afraid to, what would I say, freehand a trust. Uh, so um, our, my law partner, Landon Hodges, it's actually his job here at the office to make any changes to any document. So like if Megan went to the Academy of Special Needs Planners, 
like a new thing in special needs planning is the ABLE Acts. So we didn't have any of that in our documents before because it wasn't a thing. So now we have to do it. And it's his job then to take Megan's input, work on it, figure out where all it needs to go. He does an amazing job at that. Um, he's a graduate of Wake Forest and Elon from North Carolina. He did, he does, he really, it's his job as part of being here. Now we do use for our revocable living trust, we do use software. Um, and the reason that we do that is that we couldn't possibly keep up with all the changes in the IRS rulings. Um, and so we're really paying a service to do that for us. Um, and so I think that that's um, important for people to know. And I think for our clients, they're greatly benefited by that because I think sometimes you go places and they're trying to fit that person's situation into a form. And we don't need to do that here. We're happy to really figure out what a client's goals are and develop the language around that um, that allows us to accomplish that. And especially where we live in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of land, a lot of cabins, um, a lot of dynasty planning where we're trying to put it down generations. Um, and so it really, in order to do that well um, and to be able to do what the, the clients want, we need to do that. So it sounds like a combination of we buy some software to continually update IRS regulations with the ability to do kind of what you said is freehand a trust or like draft your internal language in your internal templates, which makes all the sense in the world. We use software. It would make sense that y'all use software. But Tommy, I know you agree with this. It's nice to know that it's more thoughtful than wealth council or whatever the other off the shelf programs are where you you fill in the blank and hit file print right we cert yeah music music to my ear to hear that we're customizing it to your situation yeah we're not just hitting file print and you're getting you know a thousand page yeah. document <laughs> most of it doesn't apply to you um, I'm curious. So I was wondering if we take a step back because um, we, we went into a trust and avoiding probate, perhaps maybe just a quick, uh, you know, why, why do, and is it true in Pennsylvania, because probate is state specific, do we want to avoid probate? Um, and why, why is that? Yeah, I think important? in all states, we want to avoid probate. Um, I would say that Pennsylvania is a little bit kinder, gentler of a state. So, John, even when you were talking in that question and you talked about in Virginia, you have to have it, it's more helpful if the person, the executor or the trustees in the state of Virginia, Pennsylvania, we're a little bit more lax on that. Um, if if let's say it was my estate and I appointed John as my executor and he's in Virginia, he actually could go to a Virginia court and get sworn in. Um, and so it's a little bit and there's no extra bond, although it used to be that way. So I can hear that. But the, the reason for avoiding probate um, is, for me, a couple of things. Obviously, we want to avoid the costs and the administration that goes along with that. So, so if you're listening, you don't even know what probate is. It's really the system by which in every state has been set up that we go in front of the court to admit a will and to um, say, this person is my executor. And then there's a bunch of rules. Um, so there's notices that have to go out. There's time periods that have to be complied with. And, and for me, um, that just is an unnecessary expense. So as soon as I use a trust, I'm getting rid of a lot of that. Now, state by state, it can be different because understand that um, the Uniform Trust Act, the code, which is in most states, still requires some notices. Um, and so there's, I wouldn't want people to listen and think you don't have to do anything with a trust, but it's less work. The other thing is that it's harder to object against a trust. And the way that it works um, is if I'm, if I'm in probate, I have a will, I'm in probate, and let's say I'm a stepdaughter or I'm an estranged or for whatever reason, I, I don't like what the will says and I want to object to it. As soon as I object to it, I bring that whole process to a screeching halt, like halt. I can't do it. Like, so the people who are supposed to get this stuff, I can't do anything. I now have to deal with this objector and I'm in court about that. And it can go out for years. I've had cases that have been 12 years over 
dumb stuff. Um, I remember I have three children. They're all raised now. But I remember like I had a case that went through three pregnancies. You know what I mean? It was just like the judge says if she comes back, you know, if this isn't over. But it really can happen. And so when I get in a trust, if somebody wants to object, I get to continue on with the trust. It's not as easy to stop me from doing what I need to do. So, uh, and this is really important if there's like a business involved and all of a sudden we can't operate the business, it becomes worthless for everybody. So really important um, from, from the whole perspective, if you're gonna have anybody objecting or you're concerned about anybody objecting, avoiding probate's also really beneficial and using a trust um, allows the person that you want to get it to be on a higher, a better footing um, I also think, you know, there are what we see so many times is that although Pennsylvania is kinder, gentler, there are many states that it's not like Florida, which we deal with a lot at our office because we have a lot of people who are Pennsylvania residents um, or Florida residents. Um, you know, that is a system where everything has to go back before the court. Um, and it's very costly and very time consuming. And for all of my clients, um, anybody who's listening, if you have real estate in more than one state, you always want to put that other real estate in something. Now, it could be a transfer on death deed. It could be a trust. But in some ways, we want to avoid probate um, so that we don't have to do what's called an ancillary probate. So that would be, let's say, I'm in Pennsylvania, but I have a double wide trailer on a piece of land in Florida. I want to put that into a trust or have it go some other way. Otherwise, I'm going to have to do an ancillary probate in Florida. And all that does is add costs um, to and time um, to our administration. And, you know, in sitting and talking to clients so many times, um, we focus on the cost. But so many times I would say that to my clients, they don't want to be a burden to their children. They really want to set up an estate plan so it's simple and easy for their children. And in that circumstance, it's so much better if you do avoid probate. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to not need a will. Because um, like in Pennsylvania, I can't put a car very easily into a trust. So usually we have a small probate estate, maybe a bank account, um, you know, a, a vehicle but then the majority of things are actually in the trust and we just administer it there. We save time and money. Um, and that's true in all states. Thank you, Julie. That's I think that's all really helpful. And as we think about trying to make things easy and avoid probate for the beneficiaries and successor people, um, there are so many people and maybe 50% or more of the folks listening to this podcast, not our clients, not your clients, but probably 50% of the people listening to this podcast don't have any documents in place right now, don't have wills, don't have powers of attorney. It's amazing how often as financial planners, we see people at or near retirement who have never drafted a document before. And that's maybe they don't wanna think about it. That's maybe it never raised to the level of importance, but it also stems from the fact that maybe they had to serve as trustee or executor and it was a pain in the you know what because mom and dad had this big book and it was horrible and it didn't do anything for me. So by golly, I'm not doing anything. Like if it's gonna be that hard, I might as well not spend the money or do anything because that was horrible. So I, I feel like it's just very important for our audience to know step one is drafting the documents. Step two is using the documents. Step three is continuing to update the documents. And if you don't do that maintenance, you know, you quite possibly created more work for your successor people than you would have. Maybe that's too strong of a statement, but you're probably still better off having done something than nothing, but but it's certainly getting complicated if we don't keep it updated over time. Florida is very interesting to us because we have a lot of clients who snowbird to Florida. So I have, I have many questions. Tommy does too, I know. Maybe Megan, really quick, you can answer this question for me is, would you ever only update financial power of attorneys and medical power of attorneys in Pennsylvania and leave a Virginia trust and a Virginia will, for example? Like, is there any scenario where you would ever do that? Or does it make sense to just move it all to PA? No, I, I certainly would in some circumstances, um, especially since wills and those those revocable trusts that i mentioned are some of those documents that tend to be more universal tend to travel better um i 
My preference is to only really update the documents that I see a need to do that. So I would say there, there could very easily be a situation where I am saying your financial POAs should be updated, um, healthcare powers of attorney maybe, and if the decision makers are still who the clients would want in the wills and the in the trust, if um, we might not need to update those documents. If they've purchased new real estate in Pennsylvania, I might just be doing a deed to put their new real estate into the trust. Um, but otherwise, there could very easily be a situation where I could be saying, you are in good shape. And what's um, the we law? We don't need to update those wills or those trusts. I think it's a law that says your trust is good here. And there's like many states across the country. It's like the common trust law or something where you mentioned that it, it travels well. I just want to kind of highlight that specific legislation that, that says why it does travel well. Yes, that sure. one. So that would be the Uniform Trust Act. Um, so yes, so while estate planning laws tend to be very state specific in the interest of uniformity and simplicity for individuals traveling across state lines, um, I'm not sure of, of the group or the organization that actually came up with the Uniform Trust Law, but there's a Uniform Trust Act and each state gets to decide whether they want to take this body of legislation and adopt it as their state's own law. If they do, they can make changes and adjustments. So it's possible that even if, a, if states have adopted um, most of the Uniform Trust Act, it's possible that maybe um, there is one or two things that's different that we might need to make some kind of an amendment. But overall, for the states that have adopted that code, they travel well. The laws are pretty pretty uniform in both states because both states have adopted um, the Uniform awesome. Trust Act as well, their here, own laws. Here's another state. question. I, I don't know, Tommy, if this was on your radar yet, but it's certainly on my mind now because, Julie, you mentioned double wide in Florida, and it's amazing how many like co-ops are in Florida and random things where you like have a hundred year lease, but you own the, the trailer. So I'm sure there's complications <laughs> there. But let, I have a client that I'm thinking of right now that religiously goes to Florida every year for three or four months. I actually have two of them. One goes in an RV, the other rents a an apartment or an RV cottage or something for three months every year. They have Virginia documents. Do we need to consider or should we consider a Florida financial power of attorney and or a Florida advanced medical directive. And what's the crossover point where it's like, you're only there for a week, we're not gonna bother. You're there for three or four months every single year, maybe we should. And y'all have, I believe, a tri-state area where maybe people are going between many different states. So how do we handle that? And what do you specifically think about Florida? Yeah, so I think anybody who's traveling to Florida for you know three months out of the year does need Florida powers of attorneys. So I think that um, when you're you know there um, often enough, consistently enough, you should be you know. And what I would, as a practice pointer to everybody, I think you go back to your Virginia attorney, or if you're from Pennsylvania, you go back to your Pennsylvania attorney and say, "Hey, I'm going to Florida," um, and we have often have clients that do that. And what I can do then is make a referral to a Florida attorney that I know that's going to just, you know, update the financial powers of attorneys and not um, have them update everything that may or may not be necessary. But I think that you do need that. And the reality of it is um, there is, you know, the U.S. Constitution would say that if I have a Pennsylvania power of attorney and it's good in Pennsylvania, it needs to be recognized in any other state. But practically, that doesn't work well. So if I would, and I don't want people to be concerned, like if I'm driving in North Carolina and I get in a car accident, if I have a healthcare power of attorney from Pennsylvania, that should be accepted in that state, particularly for those crises and emergencies. But it's going to be more difficult. And we, and we don't want to have 50 powers of attorneys, right? So, um, but when we're in Florida that often, um, and there's other states, you know, Pennsylvania is often actually people don't travel well to us with powers of attorneys, but because ours are so wordy, like they're 18 pages long, um, they actually might travel well to Florida. And so they may not need a new one in Florida, but there's other states like New York that have a statutory form uh, that you know you may need uh, a new attorney, a new power of attorney, because there's not much in that form. Most of it's within the law. And so, um, that's something that people should be looking into and getting those powers of attorneys. And it's hard to say 
how mu- how often, John, but when you said three months, that, that seems to me to be significant enough, um, you know, that I think that um, it should be um, something that people look into. And um, that way, you know, a power of attorney is such an important document because it's basically saying to the doctor or uh, the medical advice uh, or financially, this is the person I want you to talk to. This is my decision maker. And it's just important and know that some states have defaults. So like Pennsylvania, the default is if I don't have a healthcare power of attorney, if their stepchildren, stepmom or stepdad and stepchildren have equal decision-making of power, well, maybe I want that, but maybe I don't. Maybe I want my spouse to be making my decisions and my kids not to be involved. And so if I don't have that document, just know that you can get yourself into some odd defaults so it's really important. Um, powers of attorneys are the simplest documents. I do think they are the most important documents um, because when people come to us in a crisis, it is so helpful to me if I just know who they want me to listen to. Like if they just, you know, in the power of attorney says, this is my decision maker. And that's helpful because we often have people who are fighting um, who maybe see things differently. And I'm not sure who you would want me to uh, trust. But if I have a power of attorney, I now know this is the person that you wanted me to listen to. Um, And so that's really helpful. Well, we've said for a long time, Tommy, that you can't create a will or a trust from the grave and you can't create a power of attorney or medical power of attorney when you're incapacitated. So to Julie's point, I think all of this is is obviously super relevant and timely. Um, I'm going to call out a big fail for me. I just got back from a five week RV trip and I didn't take my financial power of attorney or my medical directive. And we were in Pennsylvania, we were in Virginia, we were in West Virginia, we were in Kentucky. And I didn't take, I didn't take a daggone thing. And that was probably not a good thing. So, so I need to figure out a way that I'm going to travel with this, Tommy, this is something we need to think about with clients. um, And then certainly bring up, you know, because calling it out, the people who are snowbirding are not necessarily young. So they're retired, they're at or near retirement. When is a mental incapacity or a financial um, power of attorney gonna be necessary? More likely for those folks than than not. So uh, this gives us a lot to think about in our practice too. I will say, I think um, it, maybe it's not a perfect solution, but I think it gives credence to one of the reasons we always tell clients we want the documents is because in that very you know scenario you're traveling, we have it in our repository electronically. So there is a little bit of a you know a hoop to jump through that you have to get in touch with us for us to get it to you. But we are kind of that fail safe because not only do we want to review the documents, make sure and potentially even translate it to clients of, hey, this is essentially what I believe this document says, ask your attorney these questions if you have them on what I'm saying, we wanna make sure we coordinate with it, but also just allow us to provide that service of we're another repository for you. So if you ever need these, we can quickly get them to you. Um, but yes, my mind went the same place, John. I was like, <laughs> when I'm traveling, I don't know that I've been thinking about having easy access to these. Thankfully, you and I both can use the firm <laughs> repository, so hopefully, each other our team can help us out um in those situations so we're not completely um lost i am curious as this is all you know fascinating conversation in the different directions we're going is say we've dotted our i's crossed our t's um we've got everything in place then you know the inevitable comes to pass and so now it's time for these documents to really get to work and we've you know hopefully again beneficiary retitled We've done our jobs there. What does it look like now? And I'm even curious when we talked about the probate question, um, I'm not sure if it's possible in Pennsylvania because I'm just not as familiar uh, with Pennsylvania, but John and I have seen it in Virginia. We could do our job so, so good. There is no probate. (laughs) There's nothing to probate. And at that point, it's, it's almost leaves some question marks of where do we go from here? 
Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things um, is that people will often call us right when somebody passes away. And that's great that you call us and let us know. But don't get too concerned if we say, you know, go ahead, go to the funeral, do what you have to do for your family. There's nothing that you have to do immediately, particularly when you have a trust, because we don't have to go through that probate process. So good to call the law office, but don't be too concerned if um, it's okay if things, you know, wait a week or a week and a half. Um, now, obviously, if there's a business or something else, but in a typical situation. And then what we're going to want to do um, is we're going to want to start thinking about what does the documents actually say? So, you know, some people have taken time to say, I want this teacup to go here, this piece of jewelry to go there, this gun to go there. And some people haven't, but it's very important that we think about what is written or is it just a document that says equally, everything goes equally. And then we have to decide, well, how are we going to deal with that? Are we just going to have everybody pick one thing? Are we going to get everything appraised and people get equal amounts? And there's more than one good answer to that question, but it's something that we want to start thinking about because to be honest with you, that's more often what people fight about is the belongings and understand it's, you know, it's hard because we've all just lost somebody and we're trying to grab onto um, you know, something that, that I'm fond of, although other people may say, no, you're describing onto that because it has a huge resale value. Um, although today, nothing, none of this extra stuff has really great resale value. Um, but we want to be thinking about, you know, what to do with the household contents and the, and the house itself. And I know they're not part of the documents, but just, you know, for our listeners to be aware, that's, that's a huge amount of time and often where people trip up is you know somebody goes in and they think they're being helpful and they start cleaning out the place and somebody did not want it cleaned out and so we find more family arguments over that so i think it's just better to say hey have a family meeting um if i'm the trustee this is what i think i'm going to do is everybody okay with that or did people have thoughts did somebody think mom said they were supposed to have the wooden spoon in the third drawer down, uh, you know, those types of things. Um, and so we want to, we want to deal with that quickly. And then what's going to happen is the law office is going to start sending out notices that are required by law and they trip people up sometimes because they're like, why am I getting this notice? Well, the law says you have to. So you, you get a copy of the trust, a copy of the will. Um, and it's not all that helpful because it doesn't say how much money, um, and then really the next part of it is identifying all the assets. So at our office, um, one of the things that we do is we not just do the documents, we also help people fund and we have a working list of their assets. Um, so we can really help people identify here's where all these assets are. But for some people, they don't have that. And so we're literally looking at old tax returns to see where we were getting interest income from, or we're waiting for stuff to come in the mail, um, or we're trying to get into passwords, you know, online systems, because we really have to identify how much stuff is out there. And if you're listening, one of the biggest things that 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 takes a huge amount of time, having a good list somewhere, um, many financial advisors offices do that quite well. And we need to know that. But then we'll have people who have one extra account they didn't tell somebody about. It's really hard for us to find that account. Uh, so if you don't want to share it with your kids now, please write it down somewhere, have a list, um, because that's going to take uh, whoever is your trustee time. Um, and it's a little bit of a scavenger hunt because we don't really know. Um, and then once we figure out what all's there, I think then um, understanding what the process is. So in some states, we have an inheritance tax or an estate tax. Um, we have to be paying those things. We have to worry about income tax issues. Um, so we spend a lot of time working with people, if it's an annuity or an IRA, understanding the income tax issues that come along with that. Um, and I think, again, if you were the trustee, the best thing is to employ um, a law firm that's going to be very proactive about those things. Um, so we're very proactive. We let people know, okay, the Secure Act says you can take this out over 10 years. Here's what it looks like if you take it out right now. 
And we really help people fill out those claim forms because, um, you know, the claim forms are asking, do I want it all at once? If I had to pay all the tax on it, that may not be the best thing to do. Um, and so we kind of want to go through those things. Um, so I think being a trustee also requires um, gathering that information and then also letting the beneficiaries know what to expect um, on their own tax returns. Now, just so everybody knows, um, the fact that you're making an inheritance, there's no tax. So if I have a bank account, like it was a CD, and I give that to all the kids, there's no there's no income tax on that. But there are things like annuities and IRAs that are income in respect of a decedent. And that means that there's some income tax still in there. And so we need to make sure. And so for the trustee, you might be listening, thinking, oh, wow, this is a lot of work. And kind of what I'm saying to you, though, it's not as much work if your parents had it well planned and you use advisor that are proactive. So at my office, we very much collaborate with, um, like if it was one of a, a client that John and Tommy were working with, we'd be calling them and we'd be coordinating uh, behind the scenes so that we can say to you, here's what we suggest, here's our recommendation, or we would be talking to people about individual beneficiaries about their individual situations to decide what needs to be done. So you really should lean on those professionals. I always feel bad for people who come and they decide not to use our office because they want to save the money. Um, it's just not a good thing to do. Um, listen, I do this every day uh, and I know where the pitfalls are and how to deal with people. Um, I don't change a tire or change my brakes in my car every day. I certainly use a professional it's a great to analogy, do that. Julie, and and it's, so, um, you know, the estate administration is not getting any easier. Like I think one of you mentioned or both of you mentioned yeah. Secure Act 2.0 and like at the end of the day, there's Secure 3.0 that's likely coming. The rules on RMDs are bifurcated. And I mean, Tommy and I have joked around and, and it's only a joke, clients, if you're listening, but we're like, we need to retire before all of our clients pass away because the state administration is hard. And, and it's only going to continue to get harder. So um, we just joke around about that if you're a client listening, but it's certainly um, yeah, Roth conversions. Roth and conversions. It, it's a lot of things <laughs> about. So don't sign anything yet, right? So don't sign a beneficiary claim form. Mm -hmm. Don't sign anything until yeah. you've had a qualified financial planner and a state planning firm and a state administration office guide you through this. If you're if you find yourself sixty years old with a ninety year old parent, like they're from the Great Depression, they're hiding stuff from you. Like we got to find it. Right, and then don't do that to your kids. So, so we need a treasure map. We need to look in floorboards yeah. and coat pockets and refrigerators. Um, we need a treasure map. Don't sign anything. No rush on any of this. But also, yeah. I find I think we find Tommy that a lot of times there are. I'm going to use it loosely. Professionals in quotes, like they are professionals. They do add some value, but they're not staying up with the times. And they're quoting a b trust from the 90s right. or they don't know the new estate tax limits or they're not familiar with secure act 2.0 and then certainly not familiar with the irs recently proposed or clarification on certain things of secure act 2.0 so people can look you eyeball to eyeball and say things that are very confident this is how it works and in fact they're just loud and wrong it's really hard as a consumer to know who to trust because there are people who are convicted that the 1990 rules or the 2014 rules are the same rules of today it's just not the case and and you have to be careful as a consumer on where you're getting your advice from and and i don't know if you guys see that in pa but we certainly see it tommy here um the people that are the, the highest conviction you al i almost say i'm talking too much you know how you have a good person if you say, oh my goodness, Secure Act 2.0 is really, really complicated and this is gonna take us a long time. If somebody can just like answer your questions emphatically, really, really loud immediately, you, you probably wanna caution that like, maybe you aren't familiar with all the complications that just came out. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should have thought about the question a little bit more <laughs> before you answered. 
Um, yeah, I guess as I think about like one of the things that's frustrating to me is you have professionals or people out there and the, and it's like we we're up, we're happy to do the front part of the work but now when we get into this okay it's time to execute like they've passed and now we're nowhere to be seen mm -hmm. and if we are if, if we are even willing to answer the phone or answer an email about it it's very flippant to your point or it's just not you know, it's just not helpful um and it yeah it's just it's like where are you now we we need you to help actually execute on this it seemed like you just wanted to to do the, the work on the front end i was thinking as we this was all great um and, and julie took us like here's all the proactive and like the 10-year plan and everything we need to be thinking through which is great as well as like take a pause and don't rush into it i was thinking starting a little more granular even of just or like right at the beginning of I think a lot we can't do, I could be wrong. It seems like death certificate. Like we got to get a death certificate before much of that kind of seems to kick off a lot, I think. And I, yeah, I was just trying to lay it back. Like if you've never been through this, here's kind of what the very beginning of this process looks like. And then there's a lot of thought um, to be done on the back end. Um, so I think I think a death certificate and then, yes, it's those notifying the institutions and claiming which we need to be very careful, depending upon um, the type of asset that we're dealing with there. And one of the questions I had, uh, Julie, when you uh, had your technical difficulty there for a second was what well, we see sometimes and John, I think you've encountered it is we've done our job so well that there's no probate estate, which seems great. But then we run into like little questions of like, well, who signs the final tax return? Because usually it's the executor, but we don't have or executrix. And I don't know if Pennsylvania uses the same terminology, but um, we don't have that as well as if there's a trust, um, a trust tax return. So just thinking through some little things like that. Um, I think there was uh, something else will come back to me on this. But that's kind of almost what I oh, as I segue all over the place, does Pennsylvania, I assume every state does court accountings if we have a um, certain situations. Yeah, absolutely. So in most states, um, if you can have a family settlement agreement, so it's like an informal accounting if everybody agrees and signs off. Um, but uh, we would need a formalized accounting, which are difficult to do. Now, there are states, like I know um, New Hampshire is one of the states that you need a formalized accounting pretty much in every situation. Um, even if it's kind of more informal and everybody's agreeing, you still have to submit that in front of the court. And there's many states that are that way. Um, but Pennsylvania is a state that if everybody's agreeing and uh, we can just have everybody sign an agreement informally and we call them family settlement agreements uh, so that that can be helpful. But please know there's many states that you still have to go through that formality. And unfortunately, in some states, um, they really tie the hands of the attorneys, um, making it so they can't get paid until the end um, and setting what the fees can be. And you know, estate administration isn't just all of what we're talking about today. It, in today's world, it's so much more from even getting, you know, what used to be simple, a claim form. You know, if I know how to fill it out correctly and I send it to, you know, a company, uh, it used to be they just they just got the form, accepted it and sent the check. And today I could send that same form three times before they do anything. And I could be waiting a, a good amount of time for that. But there's also huge issues right now with, you know, we advise our clients about this, about ghost hacking. So in our office, we're not just dealing with all of what we're talking about here. Immediately, we contact the three credit reporting agencies and report that the person has passed away. And the reason that we do that is that there's so much and so many people's identity that has been stolen. Um, and I have been doing that at my office for at least the last 10 years, um, because unfortunately, we had uh, two estates in one year. Where, remember, when you when somebody dies and we we report things at the courthouse, it's their date of birth. It's the, it's everything that you would need. Their social security numbers, and you know, there's even there's a whole big thing now about what they would call ghost hacking, which is really identity stealing the identity of somebody who's passed away. And and there's there's credence right now. We're talking about it at our office. It, this did come from an act tech meeting I was at, and kind of really thought about it, but. You know, maybe people shouldn't put so much information in obituaries, you know, because your mother's maiden name in the obituary, 
Um, all of what your password combinations are right there. Um, so what I would say to you too is that we focus on these like things that must be done, but at our firm, we're also really trying to help people understand what the potential threats are out there and, you know, best practices. And so um, we do, uh, we contact the three credit reporting agencies. It's not hard to do. It's a letter. And then no credit can be taken out in that person's name. And since my office started doing that, we haven't had a single decedent who's had their identity stolen um, yet that is just rampant out there right now. Um, and so I think that's important um, when we think about um, what it is that the advisors that you're working with do for administration. I think complying with the rules and the laws are important, but also understanding what those threats are or what the potential wow. hazards are. I mean, I just, just never thought, like I, my credit's frozen. And and if we end up going to buy our mm -hmm. third car for our family, like we've been talking about on another episode, you know, maybe I would do a loan, maybe I'd pay cash, figure it out. I'll have to unfreeze my credit for seven days to get the car loan approved. I never thought about like notifying the credit agencies at death. And this whole concept of ghost hacking is is fascinating. So we've learned something from this that we'll implement. Uh, how do we do this at our office? So. This is a long episode. Thanks for staying with us, audience and clients and everyone. What we do at Mason and Associates, so the funeral home is typically going to notify Social Security. So that's a done deal. All of the stuff Megan and Julie have talked about, that's something we, we know we need to do. Then we have military. So we have Defense Finance Accounting Service. We have the Veterans Administration. We have Office of Personnel Management. At Mason and Associates, we can help you notify all of those agencies so that we can claim your federal employees group life basic insurance so that we can activate your survivor benefits. Know that it may take six months to a year to activate that survivor benefit pension. So making sure we have access to TSP, IRA, those life insurance policies, um, Social Security should take care of itself. You should end up getting the higher of the two but it doesn't hurt to run it past your financial planner to make sure that you're getting the right number um, when your spouse has passed away. So ghost hacking is, is fascinating. I think both of you have mentioned this. We're not really worried about estate taxes as much anymore, at least at the federal level as we are income tax. That's more of, of what we're managing. Maybe some, some quick hit questions here. I have, I have no probate estate. I hired Megan. Megan, I've done a phenomenal job. Um, and this is for Megan or Julie. We've done a phenomenal job. Our firms work together. We have zero probate. Do I even need to do anything with the will? It's very possible that even if probate is not needed, there are still some taxes due. Specifically in Pennsylvania, we have inheritance tax. So even if at the federal level, we're not concerned about estate tax, I usually um, try to break it down that someone's estate can kind of be thought of as two different things. There's someone's probate estate, which is the assets they passed away in their own name, and how do we get ownership of that asset to the ownership of the beneficiary? But then someone's taxable estate and what is subject to tax, especially state inheritance tax, if that's applicable in someone's state, could be very different. In Pennsylvania, um, Julie mentioned life insurance is not subject to Pennsylvania state inheritance tax here, but pretty much everything else is. Um, there, there are some other exceptions. They apply very narrowly to, to folks. So even if we don't have to go through probate, very likely that we do have to um, file some kind of an inheritance tax return or do something in order to make sure that those taxes are paid and everything is reported correctly. So this may be a big difference between Virginia and Pennsylvania. We may have to follow up with our, our local folks to figure out like, what do we do if there is no probate and no inheritance tax? Um, you know, there are some times where it's like, you need to sign a form as the executor, like Tommy said, but you never physically had to qualify as executor mm -hmm. and there literally oh, is yeah. no executor. Or there's a small estate affidavit that said you never, nobody had to qualify. And it, it feels like sometimes the better job you do, you're almost penalized because there is no, there is no roadmap for the people that did a really good job. And, 
and then you show up to the clerk of courts and they don't necessarily know the answer or you go see a teller at XYZ credit union, you know, and it's the wild, wild west out there. I think too, what's interesting is we see to John's point in Virginia, at least, which it sounds like maybe Pennsylvania is different enough because of the inheritance um, tax issue that we, we seem to record a will um, even though it's never going to go through probate. So it could be very well, there's not a probate estate. Nobody's going to qualify as executor, but for some reason, I guess just to put it on record, we, we record the will, um, I guess, so that nothing comes up to you. I'm not honestly sure why that's part of our process. I just know that we still go record the will, even though we're never going to go through probate because we did our job well. So I don't know if that's something similar in Pennsylvania, if um, there is like the, the difference of like recording it versus going through the the qualification and, and do you see do you see somebody always qualifying is it like regardless like this is going to go through the court system and you will be you know granted the authority as an executor or is there times where that's, on that, that's not Tommy, a thing I'm in Pennsylvania sure, either. Julie, that yeah. if um, spouse one leaves money to spouse two there's no inheritance tax in PA between spouses so maybe we can answer this question in the context of a surviving spouse you know, would we have to record a will in Pennsylvania if spouse one dies? Yeah, so typically not. Um, and there are even situations where we have done our job and we don't have to record the will uh, in Pennsylvania. So um, we always like to see what that is. And as Tommy brought up, there are situations where it's like, well, who's gonna sign this? Um, but typically we're gonna defer back then to the trustee of the RLT. Um, so whether that's um, IRS stuff, um, the form 56, we're going to refer back to that trustee where the bulk of the, the things are. Um, and in Pennsylvania, we either probate the will or we don't. We don't ever record it. We used to years ago. We used to record them, but today we would not. Uh, we would. There would be no reason to go through that expense. So I guess the kind of the takeaway here for our audience is it's not as simple as you think. It's very state specific. And at the end of the day, it's worth, in our opinion, I think the four of us on this um, podcast episode today would agree that you should probably hire somebody because we've said it at Mason and Associates for decades now, you only live, retire and die once. You know, we've done these things hundreds of not thousands of times through our clients um, and those experiences and Julie and Megan, you're doing the same thing in Pennsylvania on the wealth preservation, the long-term care planning, the estate planning, the estate administration, that if one has, we just, we released an episode recently titled Activate Millionaire Powers. And it's uh, this whole idea of like getting out of your own way and using resources to make your life easier. Like it's time to activate millionaire powers, pay somebody to help you through this process that hopefully you only have to do one or two times in your life there's no reason other than we're being penny wise and pound foolish to go at this alone. Absolutely. And, and the money that people can save is amazing to me. And, and for some of it, for those of you looking for an estate administration attorney or looking for an advisor, I think the, the key is that people forget the income taxes. Um, and so for me, understanding that you should have an attorney that knows something about income taxes or collaborates with your accountant, with your financial advisor, um, you have to have somebody on your team that understands that um, because you could be, you know, a beneficiary and you could be, you know, getting Medicare and Social Security yourselves and all of a sudden um, you cash this out in one year and don't realize that's going to affect how much you're paying for Medicare. So just know, knowing that um, it's more complex, I think is important. Um, but I, I piggyback on John in that um, the amount of money I feel like we save people um, by helping them make a good plan and how to administer it, I, I think is um, well, that's just certainly amazing. music to our ears, hearing you throw out things like Irma and Medicare thresholds, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I guess as we we're not, I have one more question that maybe we can transition to action items and, and some takeaways from this podcast. How long does this typically take? And I'll frame this context in the question of 
My mom or dad just passed away. I am busy. I'm a professional. I've got kids. I've got all kinds of stuff going on. And now I have to serve in this capacity. Is this something that I'm going to be able to finish in a week? I'll just really grind hard and do this. Is it something that I need to have patience? Um, how long and drawn out is this process going to be? What do I need to, you know, arms and legs inside the cart at all times, buckle up. It's going to take how long? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we actually tell our clients it can take two years. Um, now I have to say that some of that has to do with Pennsylvania inheritance tax, but I think it's, it's not good to think that we're going to do this quickly and it's going to be done in a week or a month. Um, I do think, you know, a year is a good amount of time. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't do it faster. It doesn't mean that every estate's going to do that. But again, when we think about having to identify assets, then understand a little bit about our beneficiaries and get our beneficiaries to be all kind of um, ready to accept this and do the best job for them. So it could be people's siblings, you know, and understanding that. Um, I like to meet with my clients once a month and we move things forward. Um, so think about not so much how quickly can I get it done, but am I continuing to move it forward and making good decisions? Um, but, you know, I'm definitely a person that values completeness uh, and I'm detail oriented. So that's, that's why that matters to me. And please understand if you're listening, this is not about the probate situation where you can't get at the money. The money's there. We're just trying to be thoughtful about how we're collecting it. Um, so it's not like it's in a probate situation where the account's frozen and I literally can't pay my mom's PP&L bill. Um, this is the money's here. We just want to think about what makes the most sense, especially when we're talking about, you know, a million dollar IRA. Well, let, let's let's give that some thought. Uh, let's give some thought of that. And it could be that different beneficiaries want different things. And I think that's OK. Um, so let's let's help them because they could be in different situations. Some could be have people in college um, and it would make no sense at all to take out IRA money and um, reduce the the amount of money they get, you know, their kids get for help for college. So I, I think thinking about it as a year long process allows people to change their expectations. Also, if you're a busy professional, you don't have to do everything at once. There's nothing saying that, like deal with the house, deal with the belongings, deal with, you know, what's at the thing. The other things can be um, done, you know, moving forward and, um, you know, I, I think sometimes too, I, I feel bad for the person who is the trustee or is, has to do all of this. Um, and other family members are saying, let's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, let's get this all done yesterday. And, you know, I want my money and, um, really we want at the end of the day, the most amount of money to be passed through in the simplest Maybe that's manner a good, possible. Good action item is be patient, know that it's going to take at least 12 months. And then if you are serving as trustee or executor, actively communicate that to the beginning to anybody else who stands to inherit, like, I'm not dragging my feet, I'm committed to doing this, it's going to take 12 months. I understand that you just got a winning lotto ticket or whatever. But like, I'm going to do a professional job, I'm going to hire these people, mm -hmm. and it's going to take 12 months. And my intent is not to keep your money. I'm yes. not making money on your money. This, these things just take time. And I think level setting those expectations, you just became trustee, set the appropriate expectations for yourself and all the people who now you have a fiduciary responsibility to. We've never had a client get mad at us when we set expectations and we delivered. The only time a client gets mad is if you don't set expectations and you don't deliver based on what their expectations were. Right. But if everybody is on the same page and everybody has the same expectations and you hit your deadlines or you miss a deadline and you say, I missed it. Here's why I'm sorry. Those are all much better conversations than when two people have never communicated freely about how this is going to work. So Megan, Julie, thank you. Awesome content. Let's go around. I say around the table. Let's go. Let's go around the table here. Any closing thoughts, action yeah. items, takeaways? for listeners on the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. So I'll get started and I will just, again, repeat from the planning end of things. I will always recommend that um, anyone 
either get their estate planning documents in place or set those reminders with your estate planning attorney um, anytime there's a major life event or regularly to be checking in and making sure your plan is still the best plan to make sure things are going to pass um, in the way that you want them to for your beneficiaries upon your passing. And I'll just uh, jump on that and add, um, you know, really think about communicating and how important communication is in this whole process. So if you're on and you're making your own plan, one of the things we do at our office is we always offer a family meeting. So, you know, get, and I know it's hard because some people like don't want their kids to know their assets, don't want them to know what they're doing. But I would say to you, uh, you know, as the person sitting on the other side of the table, it works so much better when the other, when they, the person that you've put in charge does know, gets into the loop, um, especially after one spouse dies and the other spouse needs some help. But the same is true even at death, communication is so important. So if you are the child or the person that was chosen to be the trustee, to be the executor, um, you know, you're often chosen because um, maybe your parents think you were the peacekeeper or you were going to be very good at it. Um, and understand that your job is also communicating then with whoever else the beneficiaries are. And I think all the way around most, you know, I was court appointed for years. I think most problems um, in estates come from a lack of communication or miscommunication. So I would just add communication is really important. I love that. Yes. Communication is key. We, um, a lot of what you're saying are same principles that we try to instill in our clients of if you're particularly, if you're going to put somebody in this fiduciary role, you should give them the benefit of knowing ahead of time, what you want this to look like, where the documents, the assets, let them know what they're up against. And it is somewhat comical in my mind when people look at it as like, it's an honor to be an executor or a trustee. Like, I don't know if it's an honor. It's seeing, you know, this is, is service is what it is. And it, but if you're going to do some, do that to somebody, I think you owe it to them to have a plan and communicate the plan. Um, and I think my takeaway, John would be, you just, you can't really put a value on having experts involved in your life, particularly if you have those millionaire powers, you should be activating I love what we do with our ongoing relationship with clients and that I think we can be that continuity of, you know, getting the plan in place. And then when you're no longer here, already being familiar and being able to add a lot of efficiency and just, again, be that source of continuity of, of here's where things are. Here's what our understanding is of what they wanted, as well as the documents. Like, let us help guide you through this because everything I've heard through today is communication. So we can help facilitate communication as well as it can be fairly complicated. So don't, you don't have to go this on your own. If you're proactive, you have that relationship ahead of time. We can, um, Having we can make a relationship it a lot less painful. with an estate planning firm or a financial planning firm. I and mean, we've been hired so many times when spouse one manages the money, spouse two doesn't. And they've actually hired us so that when spouse one dies, spouse two knows they have somebody they can turn to. I mean, how many times I've heard that in my career it's like, it's worth the fee to know that the plan doesn't end when I end, that there is continuity in the plan. So establishing a relationship with a firm, both financial planning and estate planning is important. It's never too early to hire a financial planner. Find one who's gonna meet you where you are. It's never too, hurt, too early to hire an estate planning attorney. If you're going to college, if you, literally if you're 18, you need an estate planning attorney to do financial power of attorney and medical directives. The second you're having a baby, we need to talk about who's gonna be the guardian, who's gonna manage the money for the kids. Your estate planning needs change as you change. So maybe Megan and Julie, I'm sure you guys do, but maybe you only specialize with older clients. Find a law firm who specializes with younger families. Um, so that's, it's never too early to do that. Don't be worried about things taking longer than you think they're going to. It's going to be a long drawn out process. Make sure you notify the homeowner's insurance company if a house is vacant. Make sure we understand how all of that's going to work. And then understand, hopefully you're in a position that you can afford to pay the funeral bill, that you can afford to pay the tax bill, that you can help front some of this if you don't have immediate access to estate funds or trust funds. You will be reimbursed at the end of the day 
for the costs associated with you having to administer it, assuming there's money there at the end. So these are things that that we've found that often really kind of drag you down. It's like, and and we just hope that we were able to alleviate some of those concerns. We hope that this podcast provides insight into everything estate planning, everything administration, and and also what does it mean if you spend time in other states or end up moving to a new state in retirement. We thank you so much for being with us on another episode of the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. If you like our content, do all the things for us, like, subscribe, share, hit the bell notification, send us an email to Mason FP, like Mason Financial Planning at masonllc.net. We will certainly link Steinbacher, Goodall, and Yurchak, um, estate planning firm, in the show notes. If you're Pennsylvania, consider reaching out to them for your estate planning needs. Megan, Julie, thank you so much for being with us on this episode. Thanks for having us. It was wonderful. Well, thanks, everybody, again, for being here. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to our clients who are listening. Please, if you know somebody who's going through this, meaning they have a, an elderly parent who's about to pass away, they've just found themselves as trustee or executor, share this podcast with them. We've said it for a long time at Mason and Associates. You can be somebody's hero by just sharing what we're doing. They don't need to necessarily hire us, but if you share this episode, you're gonna change somebody's life and you're gonna make it better for that family. So thanks again for being with us on the Federal Employee Financial Planning Podcast. You will rest easy once your plan is done. You will see clearly just how you have won. The topics discussed on this podcast represent our best understanding of federal benefits and are for informational and educational purposes only and should not be construed as investment, financial planning, or other professional advice. We encourage you to consult with the Office of Personnel Management and one or more professional advisors before taking any action based on the information presented.